Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items. APGS welcomes everyone to become a member of the societies. It is open to global specialists, ophthalmologists, researchers, trainees, specialists, associates, and companies with affiliation in glaucoma. There are many reasons to join APGS and on screen are just a few items which we can share with you. You can register as a member by scanning the QR code on APGS members gain access to all recordings of previous uh, APGS joint symposiums, method classes, and webinars. One final disclaimer, presentations are intended for educational purposes and do not replace independent professional judgment. After the conclusion of the event, you will receive a short feedback survey and we would like uh, to appreciate if you can take a moment to complete it. I'd like to begin with the webinar proper by thanking our mentors today, Professor Kiho Park and Associate Professor Shamira Pereira. Professor Kiho Park is a professor of ophthalmology at Seoul National University and the president of the Brokma Research Society and board member of International Council of Ophthalmology, ICO. He is associate uh, editor of Journal of Glaucoma and International Glaucoma Review, section editor of British Journal of Ophthalmology, Japanese Journal of Ophthalmology, Asia Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology, editorial board member of IOBS and Korea Journal of Ophthalmology. He has served as immediate past president of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society and Korean Ophthalmological Society, and the board of governors of World Glaucoma Association. He has published more than 400 papers in scopal index journals. He was awarded the AAO Senior Achievement Award and APAO G Senior Achievement Award. Our second mentor, Associate Professor Shamir Perara, is a senior consultant ophthalmologist and clinical director of complex, complex enteral segment surgery in SNEC. At SERI, he's a co-head of bioengineering and devices. Uh, one of his passions is teaching and is the current program director of SNEC residency. As a deputy director of the MedTech office of SingHealth, she has uh, disbursed uh, more than six million Singapore dollars for innovation and supported by four million Singapore dollars for competitive research grants as PI. His core work is yielded eight by 90 invited lectureships, five chapters and more than 150 peer review publication. Now I'd like to introduce the first presenter of our first clay presentation. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mohamed uh, Iqbal. He's a, a promising young glaucoma specialist from Bangladesh, who works as a consultant ophthalmologist at uh, Isbahani Islamia Eye Institute and Hospital. He has extensive surgical experiences in managing complicated cases, especially glaucoma and cataract related as well as with glaucoma drainage devices, pediatric glaucoma surgery, and different laser procedure. He's also actively involved in teaching and mentoring in fellowship program for cataract, bow, and, and mix, and FACO, and glaucoma run by his institutes. He's passionate about clinical research and presented some of his work nationally and internationally including at Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and European Society of Ophthalmology Congresses. On top of his clinical and research work, he's also set aside to provide surgical help to rural areas in his country to reduce the cataract backlog. Now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Iban, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from Bangladesh. Uh... And thank you, Dr. Doton, for your kind introduction. And I'm really grateful to Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society for giving me this opportunity. So today I'm going to present primary angle closure disease masquerading as a migraine headache. 
which is an usual presentation in our country. Um, I don't have any financial interest to disclose regarding this presentation. So what are the objective of this presentation today? Today, I'm going to present primary angle closure diseases, specifically primary angle closure suspect and the primary angle closure. So first of all, I have now, what is angle closure? Angle closure, it refers to the anatomic configuration in which there is a mechanical blockage of the trabecular meshwork by the peripheral iris. And that anatomic alteration results in an, uh, either the iridotrabecular contact or due to the pus formation. That means the peripheral anterior sinicea formation. So what will be the angle closure diseases? That, that means this is there may be the presence of peripheral anterior sinicea, ocular hypertension associated with the primary angle closure, there may be the acute primary angle closure or glucometous optic neuropathy due to the primary angle closure. So what is the primary angle closure suspect? That means the patient already has the narrow angle and there may be, there should be more than or more than or equal 180 degree of ID2 trabecular contact, but there won't be any changes in, in intraocular pressure or there won't be any peripheral anterior sinicia and there shouldn't be any glucometous optic neuropathy. And what will be the primary angle closure? In that case, patient with primary angle closure may present with raised intraocular pressure or peripheral anterior sinicia, but there should not be any glucometous optic neuropathy. So my first case is 35 years male from Bangladesh, a school teacher who came for the routine eye checkup and with non-specific headache. There, so while we took the history, there wasn't any remarkable history, ocular history or first surgical history, but patient had the medical history of hypertension and he was taking antihypertensive for that. Other than that, as he had complained about the headache, he took pain medication on and off. And he is non-smoker and there wasn't any significant problem with other systems. So while we examined the uh, eye, his visual acuity was six by six in both eyes. Eyes pupil was reactive and there wasn't any APD and intraocular pressure was 16 millimeter of mercury in both eyes. But when we examine the anterior, anterior segment, the, it shows the shallow anterior chamber, but there wasn't any posterior se segment abnormality. So if you look at the image, first of all, first image shows the von Herrick method which clearly shows the anterior, peripheral anterior chamber depth is less than one fourth of the corneal thickness. So how we examine this, uh, how we examine or how we perform the von Herrick method. First of all, we have to split the beam and offset the viewing angle and the lighting angle around 60 degree from the limbus. So if we scatter the beam over the sclera and then put it over the limbus, near the limbus, Whenever we see the anterior chamber depth, we have to calculate that. That means the light beam over the cornea should be equal or more or less than in the anterior chamber depth. And while we perform the gonioscopy, it shows the angle close. So um, we, we diagnose the patient as a case of primary angle closure, angle closure suspect and we go for the laser peripheral iridotomy. So why we go for the laser peripheral iridotomy? As primary angle closure disease treatment is very controversial, there are a lot of options out there, but in a ZEP, ZEP trial, they showed the patient with primary angle closure suspect, they showed uh, one eye as a control and other eyes with the laser peripheral iridotomy. Those eye who underwent the laser peripheral iridotomy show reduced chances of developing PAC, that means peripheral uh, primary angle closure. So in that sense, we go for the laser peripheral iodotomy. And, and now I'm going to show the laser peripheral iodotomy, how I performed it. Here, look at the uh, laser beam. It's, uh, it's hitting the iris almost near the periphery, close to the limbus. So while we choose the site of the laser, it should be covered by the upper lid because whenever we put the laser over in an exposed area, I mean the interpalpebral area, 
that might cause the polychorea. And this uh, this study this this is one of the study which shows the visualization of the anterior chamber angle with using the optical coherence tomography before and after the laser peripheral iridotomy. First image shows uh, there was an angle closure angle closure in the uh, anterior segment OCT, but after laser peripheral iridotomy, it shows the open angle. So uh, that's it, and this one is my case actually. And I'm going to present the second case later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ipan. So now, please, uh, um, Professor Samira Perala and Kiho, please uh, give out the uh, analysis. Samira, please. Th th thanks for that case, uh, Dr. Iqbal. It was a, a very nice example of a um, PACS case. Just want to ask you a quick question about the um, management. When you did the LPI, are your routine management to do uh, just YAG iridotomies or do you do the sequential ones? And also, do you ever use a lens to do the uh, iridotomy through? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your question. Actually, uh, while we perform the uh, laser peripheral iridotomy, mostly we don't use the lens when the patient is cooperative. And patient, if the patient is cooperative, if I if I can expose the eyes properly, then yeah, I don't have to use the lens. But uh, initially, I should recommend to use the lens in if the um, to avoid to avoid the blinking or to fix the eyeball in a proper position. And uh, actually, I do the uh, we actually prefer single iridotomy if it is patent if it is uh, first go then yeah if it is patent it's okay but if uh, we evaluate the patient after 15 days actually in the in that time we uh, we treat the patient with steroid like prednisolone acetate and maybe sometimes uh, oral anti oral anti glaucoma medication like timolol meliate maybe otherwise we just prescribe the uh, steroid that's great. I want you to uh, trust me on something. So I want you to try something next time you do the laser peripheral iridotomy. I want yeah. you to try it at um, temporally. Okay. Okay. At, at three or nine o'clock. Okay. Because we've been moved over to that for the last maybe 10 years or so. And we find that there is very, very low incidence of, uh, you know, getting these uh, photopsia Im images. And the, the I, I know what you're saying that previously, yes, we did like to put it under the upper lid. But we find that, you know, actually putting it in a place where it's visible all the time, yeah, is actually fine. It's only when it's partially visible, partially not visible, then you end up with problems that patients do see this uh, dysphotopsia. But actually, we've been moved over to the temporal LPI, and it seems to work very nicely. Thank you. Professor Park, would you like to comment on the images? I know you have a, a special interest in imaging of the answers. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I have a question uh, to Dr. Iqbal. <clears throat> so um, when we evaluate the angle, we also look at the contour of the iris. So uh, what was the contour of the iris? Was, was it uh, con convex or just a flat uh, or it, concave? Yeah, well, it was almost flat, actually. Mm. And the cent central entry chamber is also shallow, or was it uh, like a similar to normal? Is, it, that's, that is my question. The, the chamber in the, in the center, central part of the cornea, um, I think Dr. I Iqbal's video is stopped. Okay. I think uh, I think he may have problem with connection. Hello. Hi. Yeah. No, sorry, but yeah. So what, what what was the central anterior chamber depth? Was that also shallow, or central anterior chamber was deep? Um, it was also shallow. Okay. That that means um, iris is a little uh, convex. Um, I'm asking because if the central anterior chamber is uh, within normal, we, we call that plateau iris. Yeah. So I think it's not plateau iris, but um, uh, I think it's uh, um, uh, ordinary and uh, narrow angle in when we look at the uh, mostly in the primary angle closure suspect. 
So I think um, uh, you did very good job on uh, laser peripheral iridotomy. Mm. Um, but uh, in, in our Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society guideline, we are not doing all um, PACS case for um, laser iri uh, peripheral iridotomy. So um, what, what was your rationale to perform laser peripheral iridotomy in this uh, suspect case? Um, actually, it's true. We don't go for the laser peripheral iridotomy in most of the cases. Uh, if the patient is symptomatic, if the patient has um, frequent or irregular headache, mostly in the evening time, and mm -hmm. if there's um, more than 180 degree uh, narrow angle, and mm -hmm. if there's any history of raised IOP or uh, acute attack in the opposite eye, then yeah, we should go for the laser peripheral iridotomy in that cases. And another thing is, most of the patient uh, we are dealing here is not that much cooperative. So they won't come for the regular follow-up. So right. you need to be in the safe side. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there won't be any acute attack later on. So the patient has history of a headache. Um, that, that may be some IOP elevation happened, but we, we cannot prove it. So mm -hmm. in that case, yeah, he, he has a high risk. So I, I agree, you, you do the peripheral iridotomy. And just one thing to add to that, you know, if the patient needs to be dilated for any reason, if they've got significant retinal disease, then it's also worthwhile to uh, do the LPI. But I agree, we're I've massively cut down the number of LPIs that I, I do at present. And I'm just going to ask something from um, Professor Park. You know, um, there's been plenty of studies from, from Korea about the, 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 the triple hump uh, from maybe, maybe five years back or so. Do you still use that as a sign? On ASOCT. Um, yes, sometimes a triple hump is a, like a Mount Fuji sign. So in, in those cases, um, pupillary block is um, quite typical. Um, but uh, but mostly we we look at the angle, and mostly we uh, we are using um, angle evaluation, and also we perform. Um, if the the instrument is available, we perform anterior segment OCT as well. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, case and uh, analysis. Uh, so please uh, remember that uh, after three cases, we have uh, 15 minutes for discussion. So uh, uh, if any of you have a question to the presenter or to the mentor, please uh, go to the chat box uh, in the in the below. And uh, um, so type in the uh, question to our presenter or to our mentors. So now let's uh, move on uh, to the second case from uh, Vietnam, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, Dr. Nguyen Thai Dat works in uh, Vietnam National Eye Hospital on uh, demand department and science management and training center. He earns his medical uh, degree on his postgraduate certificate on uh, refraction training from Vietnam uh, Military uh, Medical University. He received his uh, certificate of ophthalmology from Hanoi Medical University. Then he uh, started uh, working for Vietnam National Eye Hospital in uh, 2020 and uh, completed his master's degree in glaucoma uh, <coughs> uh, from the University of uh, Medicine and Pharmacy, Vietnam National University. Aside from his uh, clinical work, he also participates uh, as a teacher in several training programs for students and nurses uh, while participating in uh, research work. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, now you may now begin your presentation. Please. Good, ev good evening, everyone. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you today. Um, uh, uh, to, uh, my, my name is Dr. Nguyen Thái Đạt. I'm from Vietnam National Eye Hospital. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, present my clinical case. This is a 37-year-old female who, uh, who had a blurred vision in her right eye since October 2022. She had a blind spot in the central of her right eye in the last few months. Other from that, she had no other symptoms. Uh, she, uh, there's no remarkable event in her past medical history. Um, in her right eye, 
the visual acuity uh, was counting finger one meter and her IOP was 20 millimeter mercury. Uh, her anterior chamber was deep and quiet. Her anterior chamber angle was grade four. <clears throat> uh, her cup to, uh, cup to dish ratio was uh, 0 0.9. And I noticed uh, um, a very, very clear uh, glaucomatous optic nerve damage. Uh, and there, there was no fovea light reflex. <clears throat> Uh, with the uh, central scotoma and 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 uh, very low visual acuity, I um, uh, uh, I figured that uh, might, there might be some problem with the macular, <clears throat> and uh, my, uh, and I thought of two possible diagnoses. That would be normal tension glaucoma and optic pits. The <laughs> the optic pits often lead to uh, a play a role as an engine for the fluid to travel into the sub, uh, subretinal space, which could lead to retinal detachment, retinocysis, and cystoid macular edema. Uh, I, had the patient, I had the patient uh, underwent the visual field test. However, the patient couldn't uh, cooperate uh, enough. Uh, so the, the, uh, the false negative uh, errors uh, was off the limit. Uh, in OCT, uh, there was um, severe glaucomatous optic nerve uh, damage. <clears throat> so uh, the results from visual, uh, visual field test uh, was unreliable. Uh, then we proceed uh, to have the, uh, the patient done the water drinking test. Her IOP, um, her right eye IOP rose from 20 millimeter mercury to 26 millimeter mercury after 15 minutes and it uh, peaked at uh, 27 millimeter mercury after one hour. So this confirmed our diagnosis that uh, this, this must be the uh, primary open angle glaucoma. <clears throat> With the central scotoma and low visual acuity, uh, it could be from the retinal detachment, retinocysis, cystoid macular edema, central serious, retinopathy. We had the patient underwent OCT and fluorescein angiography to differentiate uh, this condition. Uh, in uh, in FA, we noticed that uh, there was we couldn't uh, we, we didn't see any leakage, so this uh, uh, we uh, we eliminated the possibility of central serious corio retinopathy. In OCT, uh, the, we noticed that the, the neurosensory retina is separated from the uh, retinal pigmented epithelium. So we thought of a retinal detachment and retinocysis, uh, and there was no retinal tears. So, uh, so we figured that the, 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 the liquefied features couldn't enter the subretinal uh, space. They were splitting between retinal layers between the inter, uh, in, um, <clears throat> uh, internal limiting membrane and the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer between the outer plexiform layer and the outer nuclear layer. <clears throat> there was disruption in many retinal layers and there was no leakage according to uh, FA previously. Uh, <clears throat> This all lead to one conclusion that the splitting uh, of retina must be uh, begin from within the retina itself. So we, uh, uh, so the, uh, this confirm our diagnosis would be retinosis. Uh, uh, the, the diagnosis of the right eye uh, was POAG and retinosis. We began the treatment with monotherapy with dafluprost. And for the retinosis, we uh, decided to only uh, observe. After two weeks, the, uh, the IOP was controlled, even after uh, doing the water drinking test. So we continued the same treatment. Uh, for the retinosis, we noticed no progression at all. I'd like to end my presentation by reviewing about uh, retinosis. It was uh, the, uh, it is a microstoic degeneration of the neurosensory retina with the splitting at the outer plexiform retina. 
uh, when uh, retinal CCs is uh, suspected, uh, then the investigation needed are OCT, fluorescent angiography, and visual field tests. <clears throat> uh, the diagnosis should be based on the dome-shaped elevation of retinal inner layers with uh, uh, brick, brick at the outer plexiform retina. Visual field, te uh, visual field test uh, should uh, result with uh, absolute scotoma and uh, is very important uh, to, to uh, uh, dif differentiate other diseases, uh, especially retinal detachment and central serious chorioretinopathy. Uh, retinal cysts uh, is benign, so, so um, only, uh, only observation uh, is needed. And uh, sometimes there were complications uh, due to the, the breaking of retinal inner and outer world, which will lead to rheumatogenous retinal detachment. Uh, another complication is posterior extension. When these happen, uh, then uh, surgery and laser um, is, uh, are needed. Review on the role of water drinking tests. The test uh, is used to predict the maximum IOP during a diurnal tangent curve. The patient quickly consume one liter of water and have the IOP measure every 15 minutes. Um, <clears throat> the test is considered positive when IOP rise to uh, for, uh, six to eight millimeter or increase uh, about 30% compared to baseline. The water drinking test uh, is more accurate compared to 24-hour intraocular pressure uh, monitoring. And according to many authors, the test is more reliable and practical compared to tonography. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dad, for a uh, very interesting uh, case. So I'd like now to invite uh, our mentors to about uh, the analysis. <laughs> let me let me start first. Um, Dr. Um, Nguyen, uh, your presentation was very, very excellent. Um, I agree that uh, there are two problems. One is um, around the optic nerve and no fiber layers. The other one is around the macula. So for the first issue, you diagnosed glaucoma uh, very, very uh, effectively. So the pressure was 20 in the right eye and 18 in the left eye. So it was within normal. But uh, after water drinking test, the IOP was elevated. So I would recommend um, to measure the in diurnal IOP with different times at office or uh, if, if the patient can admit in the hospital, you can, you can measure the 24 hour IOPs. Then you may find some IOP elevation as well. In that case, we, we, we diagnose the primary open angle glaucoma because the optic nerve shape and the OCT retinal nerve fiber layer analysis show the definite glaucomatous change. So in the, the left eye also, we, we can find some no fiber layer damage in the arcuate bundles. So the left eye is, I think it's also a normal tension glaucoma or if the IOP elevation was found by diurnal measurement, you, we can we can diagnose high tension glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma as well. For the uh, macular change, you um, differential di your differential diagnosis is very excellent. Uh, you ruled out uh, central serous chorioretinopathy by there's uh, no leakage at all by fluorescent angiography. And also, um, um, you you ruled out retinal detachment because there is no communication between the vitreous and uh, uh, subretinal fluid. And also, you you ruled out um, cystoid macular edema by OCT as well. <clears throat> um, so retinal schisis, I agree, uh, it's a uh, good. But there is another possibility that um, there is a paper that uh, occult um, optic disc pit can also induce such such a typical dome shaped elevation of the macula, and um, between the dome shaped elevation and the disc, there are some retina retinal schisis as well. So we may think about occult, undetected or missed 
optic disc pit. Usually, if the disc cupping is advanced, um, there is a there is a report that uh, optic disc pit uh, detection is sometimes uh, difficult. So we may think about some fluid is from from the the disc part to the intra retina and to the macula, because um, if I review the fluorescent angiography, there is no leakage, so it, we can rule out CSC. But um, the the some um, temporal part of the disc was stained, so that means that area is quite suspicious of undetected or missed uh, optic disc pit. So it's it's um, it's not. Uh, uh our our uh fault but uh but it, it happens so uh undetected occult case can be a, another possibility i think so thank you very much for your presentation thank, thank you thank you for your sharing now, uh, Dr. Tash, I've got a question for you about your water drinking test, if you don't mind. Thank you for an excellent presentation. It's a good case with uh, significant pathology on both sides, spanning glaucoma and retina. Now, everyone does the, glaucoma, the water drink drinking test differently, you know, in terms of what's considered a significant rise in pressure, how long do you do it for, how much fluid do you give them? Can you outline your details about how you perform the test? Uh, yes, we uh, we have the patient to uh, consume uh, one liter of uh, water quickly, and then we monitor. So it's not based on their weight, not based on the patient's weight. Uh, yes, yes, we, we based on no. the weight. Yes, uh, yes. Um, uh, some people do, some people don't. So you're not based on weight. So the next question is, uh, what's considered a significant rise in IOP? Some people say six, some people say eight. Uh, I think uh, uh, I uh, I think uh, it's uh, the the rise should be uh, more than six millimeter mercury. Okay, personally, yeah. I would go for eight, but you know that's the thing with the the water drinking test the uh, the way it's performed and the ways it with which it's interpreted is different depending on who does it. How long do you do it for? Two hours or longer? Well, we we do it for uh, one hour. And yeah, and we uh, keep um, uh, have the IOP measurement every fifteen minutes. Okay, and which cases do you pick to do the water drinking test on? Mm, well, uh, we do, we uh, perform the test on uh, um, <clears throat> on uh, cases that uh, we are not sure if uh, is uh, um, uh, when uh, the when the when the IOP was uh, 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 normal in in. Um, in the in the safe border, uh, then we try the the water drinking test um, in um, uh, in a coordinate with uh, other tests. Okay, if I can uh, just expand this question to to Professor Dotan as well, do you use this test a lot, or how do you make the best use of this? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, we we will do a test for two hours. Um, uh, because, uh, and uh, we measure the IOP every 15 minutes after the loading of uh, water. So um, uh, the doses was calculated as a 20 mil for one, one kilo. And um, we, we, now we, we prefer to, to use that test instead of a uh, uh, 24 hour down uh, tonography because uh, we thought that is uh, more practical and more reliable. Uh, for for patient uh, uh, for twenty four hour down of tonography, we need to hospitalize the patient and measure uh, the IOP many times uh, during a day uh, for three consecutive days. So it's very time consuming and maybe not very practical for for a suspect uh, like this. So we we think that the uh, W um, uh, water drinking test can be a sort of good very good surrogate to the. 24-hour uh, uh, or uh, tonography. So just a quick question to Professor Park. Uh, Kiho, do you think that they test the same things doing the 24-hour uh, you know, phasing versus doing the water drinking test? Well, um, nowadays, normal tension glaucoma and high tension glaucoma is a, is a continuum. So um, if we, if we um, 
diagnose glaucoma not by IOP, but by optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer change, we diagnose it glaucoma. So the IOP itself is 15, 13, 12, 11, it doesn't matter. But uh, still, still IOP is important, but for the diagnose, um, it's primary open angle glaucoma. And if we perform diurnal IOP change, and it is within normal range, we, we, we diagnose it normal tension glaucoma, but treatment is the same. So um, for some suspicious case, we can perform water drinking test and it is quite effective, but we do not do routinely for the, uh, uh, for the diagnosis of uh, glaucoma. We, we do not perform a water drinking test uh, routinely in our, in our country, but it depends on the, the doctor's uh, preference, I think. Yeah, I think you're seeing a resurgence and I, I like to look at it some more in detail. I wonder about your parameters. Do you look at the things the same way as uh, myself and Dr. Dotan, we look at it the same way, same duration of, of uh, testing, same dosage, or do you look at more like uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dat's parameters? In other words, giving like a set dose of one liter of water, measuring over one hour, looking for a pressure rise of eight, six, six. Six. Which one do you go towards? Kehoe. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll use six. And okay. yep, one liter. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite similar to his. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one, one more comment I would like to make at the, about the, the, the problem of the, the macular problems, the retinal schizis. Uh, Kiho uh, talking about the uh, one possibility of the optic pits, uh, mm -hmm. but, but uh, because I'm, I'm also a retinal surgeon and I've done some retractomy for, for those cases and uh, uh, the, the clinical picture is, is the same, exactly the same with uh, with with the image of the retinal, the macula is like this with some uh, some some uh, schizis and detachment, but uh, we can differentiate with the FA with approach in the angiography on optic pit. We we still see the leakage from that uh, because we should show that the communication between the pit and the sub retinal space. Yeah, I agree. Um, but uh, not not always. Leakage is not always in the subretinal area um, because the communication is not not always um, open. Sometimes it is closed. Sometimes it is open, like a check valve. So um, in in the reports, uh, Valsalva increases the subretinal fluid, but uh, without that. It, it, it is stable. So um, the fluorescent angiography itself cannot differentiate, but we, we may diagnose the shape shape of the subretinal fluid and the location of the subretinal fluid. And some retinal schizis is between those dome shape and disc. So it is quite typical um, shape of the optic disc pit associated maculopathy, I, I suppose. I suspect. Okay. Uh, so uh, because of uh, the matter of time, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nguyen. So now let's move on to the third case uh, from uh, Dr. Iban. Uh, remember that you can uh, put the question on the chat box and we can have uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes after uh, three cases for discussion. So please, uh, Dr. Iban, for the second case. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm going to uh, present my second case. This one is the 49 years female housewife who visited us with a history of pre uh, frequent headache and occasional nausea, especially during the evening time. And she also complained about the color halos and wetting from the right eye. On ocular, uh, on uh, history, uh, she doesn't, uh, she didn't give any remarkable history regarding the ocul uh, past ocular history or past any surgical history. But on medical history, she, she, she was diagnosed case of hypertension and diabetes, and she was an oral analgesic and as well as antihypertensive medication. 
And on systemic review, there wasn't any significant pathology. So while we examined the patient, she had the visual acuity of 624 in the right eye and 612 in the left eye. Pupil was reactive and there wasn't any apparent pupillary defect. While examining the uh, intraocular pressure, it was 24 millimeter mercury in the right eye and 18 millimeter mercury in the left eye. And confrontation visual field was full in both eyes. And while examining the anterior segment, her uh, both eyes show shallow anterior chamber with nuclear sclerosis grade two in the right eye and nuclear sclerosis grade one in the left eye. And posterior segment showed no retinopathy or glaucomatous changes in the optic nerve head. These are the anterior segment imaging of that patient. If we uh, look at the first image, it shows the von Herrick method the anterior chamber depth is less than uh, one fourth of the uh, peripheral anterior chamber depth is less than one fourth of the corneal thickness. And while we examine the uh, examine with gonioscopy. First, initially, it shows the angle closure, and while we indent the patient, indent the indent with the gonioscopy, it shows the peripheral anterior sinicia. So we diagnose this patient as a case of primary angle closure. So uh, we treat the patient with uh, cataract extraction, as the patient has the visually significant cataract in his right eye, and this was this is the short video of the patient. <clears throat> Um, it, it is a routine cater case. So as I said earlier, treatment of the primary angle closure diseases is controversial. There are so many options regarding the treatment of the primary angle closure disease. So why I go for the cataract surgery, cataract surgery in that case? Because girl study showed there is a lens extraction, clear lens, either it's, it may be the clear or with the visually significant cataract, patient with uh, cataract extraction lowered the intraocular pressure as well as it may, uh, it, it won't affect the uh, visual, uh, visual field as well. So I went for the cataract surgery in that case. So, so uh, my take home message regarding the primary angle closure disease, we have to take the proper history and routine gonioscopy is must. And there are some uh, other components other than the primary angle closure, which is lens induced glaucoma and uveitis. And treatment as there are so many controversies regarding the treatment, we have to tailor the uh, tailor the treatment options according to the individual individual patient so thank you thank you very much uh, thank you very much uh, again uh, dr ibban for the uh, interesting uh, case i'd like to be, uh, invite uh, professor uh, samira in uh, kiho for the analysis samira please Thanks, Dr. Iqbal. It was, it was a nice case and a very slickly performed surgery. Now, just to ask you a few questions about your preferences for FACO in PAC eyes. Have you had any experience with doing GSL for PAS or in adding on a mixed procedure in angle closure PAC eyes? Um, first thing, we don't have the options for mix in Bangladesh. So till now, it is the laser peripheral hydrotomy or the cataract surgery or the combined surgery, like the trabeculectomy with cataract or without cataract. These are the options we are available, we are doing here right now. So how about GSL, gonisanicolysis? Um, it's not also available. We don't actually do that here till now. 
Okay. And how do you find your results in those eyes that you have performed uh, plain FACO on with PAC? Do you find that they're predominantly drop free? Uh, yeah, most of the time we don't have to prescribe any anti glaucoma medication, as and we have to keep the patient for a longer period of follow up. So if there's any change, yeah, we might we may add the anti glaucoma medication. Other than that, we don't have to most of the time. And you have a lot of angle closure in your uh, yeah most okay. most of the cases are angle closure. Oh right, okay, okay. And so theoretically, theoretically, it's different, but but we are practically getting a lot of angle closures, even in the younger patient right now. Over to you, Kiho. Oh yeah, I have questions to Dr. Iqbal. So um, the in the in, the, in that case, the the visual acuity was a six over twenty four, and the, the the lens condition was a nucleosclerosis grade two. So um, was the patient hyperopic or anatropic or myopic? And the other question is, is there any other cortical um, catara, cortical opacity as well? Um, patient was a bit myopic, but uh, there are some cortical changes as well. But uh, theoretically, patient should have open angle, but somehow it develops the angle closure as you see it in the gonio, gonioscopy. There was indent, while uh, we indent the patient, it showed peripheral anterior sinicia. And the IOP was a bit in the upper limit. So yeah, we go for right. the cat surgery. Yeah, I'm I'm asking because if the patient is hyperopic and if there is a cataract, only nucleosclerosis, the patient vision is getting better. better yeah. For example, in, in near sight, for the near near vision is good. But I think, yeah, it's it's uh, quite uh, re reasonable that the patient is myopic and nucleosclerosis. So um, the, the, it may disturb his uh, heart vision as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the analysis and my presentation. So now I'd like to open to the all, uh, all of us, uh, to all audience for the uh, Q&A section. We have uh, about 10 minutes for the question and answer. Um, uh, so you can... Uh, uh, raise your hand and uh, can turn on the microphone to to ask question and to share the the comments, or you can put the question on the chat box. Uh, may I call on Doctor uh, Baswati Shau? You, you have many questions on the chat box, and uh, uh, please uh, maybe. Uh, Turn on the microphone and uh, ask uh, the presenter uh, mentors directly if you want to. Uh, Hello, uh, I think now I think my microphone is on. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Yeah, first of all, uh, very good presentations by the speakers. Uh, like I'm practicing in New Zealand and we often uh, get similar uh, cases. Uh, for the, we will let's start with the PSC, the third case. So yeah, as the uh, uh, professor has uh, already pointed, I think goniosinic, I have few comments like goniosinicolysis, I think is a very easy procedure to perform. And uh, it is really good and it really uh, is good and takes care of the intraocular pressure post-operatively. Uh, the second thing is there are, because the, while doing the cataract surgery, sometimes it's very challenging. Sometimes it results in a high vitreous pressure. So uh, the precautions which uh, we can take, probably one would be the use of mannitol if the anterior chamber is, it all depends upon how shallow, what is the depth of the anterior chamber. Uh, I don't know uh, the experience of the other uh, panelists, but. I found like in a, particularly in angle closure patients, whether it is a PSC or a PSCG, the vitreous push is very high, particularly when you are doing the rexis or following the cataract surgery. So uh, using mannitol really helps. Also, I would like to understand the opinion of the other panelists on this case. So I think the question is about the gonioscycle analysis. 
So, so, uh, uh, Dotan, I mean, you have a lot of experience in this. We were involved in a randomized control study of uh, GSL versus plain FACO um, uh, in eyes with uh, PAC and PACG. Do you want to give us your experience, Dotan? Um, I'm a big fan of the GSL. <laughs> I have to say that because um, it's very, very like you, Dr. Baswati said, it's very easy to, to do and uh, it's it takes you about two minutes to, for the GSL or 360 degrees. So I think it's very mild and, and very quick procedure added very well on to the FACOS uh, surgery uh, alone. Um, unfortunately for the our trial with the uh, uh, SERI and uh, with uh, some from Thailand and so Hong Kong, we didn't show the, the significant difference in terms of IOP mm -hmm. reduction in FACO alone and FACO GSL. But in, in I after that trial, I, I did myself on other trial. I have to say that the uh, uh, FACO GSL is very effective, especially for the, for the acute attack uh, we, uh, that uh, non responsive to the medical treatment uh, with uh, significant catch up. Yes, exactly right. Can I also add that? Sorry, can I add that? Like, I have been also doing lots of makes, like eye scans. So if the patient has a PSC, in particular, when there is a sinicae or the pressures is very high, I don't even do a goniosinucleosis and I do eye stents and these patients put in particular have been really doing well. So I think again, I'm quite a pro thing in, in terms of mix. I would use the mix in particularly patients who are already having a sinicae or whose pressures are very like high before the cataract surgery. Uh, so it may be for, for you, so Shamira, you, you talked also mentioned about the mix uh, and FACO. Yeah, that's right. So we have a lot of experience in doing MIGs in angle closure eyes. I mean, purely as a off-label use for all of the MIGs, actually. But um, it's quite interesting. You have to pick your cases very, very carefully in terms of, you know, how much angle closure there is. Are you going to do a GSL as well? Where are you going to place the device? Which device are you going to use? And it's recently we've had a look through our results they're actually quite good of using MIGs in selected cases in angle closure and angling them upwards so that they don't develop PAS as well so I think it's promising it's an area that I would like to investigate some more but I think the jury's out at the moment I must remember that it's off-label use at present. Kiho, how about you you have experience in TM MIGs in angle closure? Yeah um in in angle closure, I've done a uh, Zen operation after um, cataract surgery. Um, if the the angle is open after cataract surgery, um, Zen operation it works. But without without cataract surgery, the Zen into the uh, narrow angle sometimes it is closed by iris. Uh, so I, I don't like that uh, condition. Um, about Ahmed, I've, I've done Ahmed tube in the angle, angle narrow angle case, but um, sometimes it's, it's, it's very close to cornea, so it's not good. So in, in, um, in narrow angle or angle closure cases, I do cataract surgery first, and sometimes I do combined or for the, for the mix or combined surgery for trap, combined surgery for Ahmed as well. Thank you. And uh, I have uh, another question uh, uh, concerning the water, water drinking test. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud uh, uh, said uh, water drinking test is generally an easy test. However, a standard protocol is not found in the literature. There is uh, this agreement on how much water is to be taken and this agreement on how quickly IOP needs to be uh, checked. Uh, somehow flow channels takes the initial burden, but uh, then fail later in the other. The outflow may be uh, affected uh, earlier. So um, uh, for that question, I, I think that is somehow is standardized in, in literature because uh, uh, in the textbooks, they always say that it's about 20 mil per, 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 per kilo. And uh, also patient always fasting. 
uh, before the, the the test because uh, if uh, the the stomach is not empty, the person cannot take you know one lead and half uh, very quickly. So, Samira, do you think that is standardized in in textbook or uh, what are they being test? No, I don't think it's standardized enough. I mean, even from this discussion already, we've seen how there is variations in uh, the amount of water drunk in terms of the what is considered a significant response in terms of six or eight, in terms of how long you do it for, one hour or two hours. So mm. there are quite a few differences. I'd like to see a standardized protocol, but I think it might depend on the particular area that you're interested in. Yeah, I agree. For the darkroom prone position test, the, the um, IOP um, criteria is uh, uh, different according to the reports. Some some report they they do eight millimeter of mercury high. Some some report they use a six millimeter of mercury high. So I I think it's the same situation for the water drinking test as well. Okay. Uh, so any any comments? Any more questions? Uh, a, a question from uh, um, what is the prognosis for retinal schizis and how many per percent will uh, the patient recover the QT? Uh, Dr. Dad, can you have uh, some comment or answer to that question? Um, well, the uh, the uh, prognosis of uh, retinal schizis uh, it can uh, range from from very poor vision to 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 uh, to uh, 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 to good vision and and uh, and uh, it depend on whether the whether whether the uh, complication uh, ha uh, happen or, or not. Uh, in most cases, uh, the the lesion it, it just uh, the same. It it doesn't progress. Um, so uh, um, I uh, actually, uh, in my own experience, I haven't uh, met uh, many ca uh, retinal uh, cases. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so it's uh, it's uh, quite uh, hard to to to, uh, to 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 tell if uh, about the, the the chance of um, um, visual uh, of vision uh, recovery. Uh, so let, let me let me have comment on this uh, uh, problem. Uh, there are two types of retinal schizis. The uh, peripheral uh, type is uh, uh, sometimes we can get the, the break, the tear uh, on the outer layer of the schizis. So uh, that can cause the uh, retinal detachment. And uh, uh, for those cases, we need the uh, surgery to, to, to deal with. Uh, so the second form is the central form of retinal schizis. Uh, this form is uh, uh, very affecting in, in terms of the, uh, the central vision because it is right in the center, but it's progressing very slowly. Uh, so because, uh, uh, we have, of course, we have no uh, specific treatment for retinal schizis. Uh, it normally is uh, 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 genetically inherited and uh, and we don't have a specific treatment. Uh, so thank you very much for your very interesting uh, uh, session. And uh, uh, please uh, remember that uh, we open up uh, this uh, platform for all of us uh, to share the, the interesting cases, share the knowledge and experience. If you have any interesting cases, uh, please uh, send a summary of the case to the or secretary, and uh, we may, maybe the, uh, we will uh, present that case in the next webinar. Uh, a big thank uh, to all of you, to all of attendees today uh, that uh, uh, conclude the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society in the Euro, uh, YG program. Uh, make sure that you enjoy us next month at Matters class where Professor uh, Berara, our mentor today, along with the Professor Kesara uh, Pata Nitpiton to deliver the lecture on uh, medical therapy for glaucoma. As mentioned earlier, we will receive uh, a short survey to provide your feedback on this event. 
uh, your participation will help us um, improve on the future professional and development offerings. ABGS have a YouTube channel and we invite all of you to subscribe so you can be updated our latest content. Have a wonderful day or evening depending where you are and uh, I may now uh, disconnect. Thank you very much.